I mark higher yeah. Hey Zach. Hey, hey, hey. And see the whole 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Um, how many how many people do we have today? Shows 20. Let me see. You want more? I can uh... no, I'm just I just wanted to get have a sense of how many people. Yeah, it definitely will echo. <laughs> Yeah, 20, 20 people today. So if twenty people if twenty people sign up, how many people show up? Uh, I don't know. Probably 15, 20. Okay. We've been actually been getting a good turnout. Hey Paul, hi um, Margie, hi Lean. How are you guys? Hello. Hey, how are you? Uh, Maggie. Hey, how are you? Joe, how are you? Marika, how are you? Oh, here's Greg. Greggy Greg. All right. All right. Well, people are getting together. I uh, just want to mention that besides today's presentation, we have two more this week. Uh, oh, somebody just sent me a message. Uh, oh, Lynn. Okay, Lynn. Lynn. All right. How are you, Lynn? Um, so yeah, uh, we have two more presentations this week. Tomorrow is ancient arms and armory, um, particularly bone error, and you know, and uh, hopefully Sergio will get back to me. And we have one tomorrow at seven, and then on Sunday we have Hansia leak. Um, very interesting subject matter. The Hansia leak we have. Sunday, yeah. I didn't. I, I don't think I saw that one. I have to look it up. That's a topic of interest to me. Yeah, that that's gonna be Aaron presenting. So. And that's what day? That's Sunday, at at four, and then uh, tomorrow at seven at Sergio. Yeah, I got the Sergio one. So, um, oh, I do have it. Okay, yeah, three three o'clock on Sunday. Actually, four. No, I have three. Oh, because it's your time. Ah, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so today's subject matter, uh, we'll let people come in and we'll just talk a bit. Yeah, that's uh, what we want after we give them a chance. Yeah, we're talking about Rommel, right? Um, one of the. Uh, famous generals of the World War II. And, uh, you know, as had Mark had mentioned, one of the few that didn't end up, you know, um, ruining his reputation uh, through um, concentration camps and all other uh, stuff and been very courteous to the opposing um, uh, officers. Um, and Mark will talk about it as well. Uh, and he was a folk folk hero for uh, for Germans actually, which is you know Goebbels used to praise him a lot. So, um, and even though you know uh, person to person he was a pretty um, well, I don't know what the appropriate word. I think he was pretty tough on these soldiers, and they were not looking forward to seeing him. Uh, so soldiers would run away and officers, even officers would run away from him, even though they, have, they do lot, they did um, respect him, but he was very hard on them. So, and then um, Mark will get through that. And um, so Mark, you another couple of minutes, what do you want? Yeah, do? yeah, well, I can start whenever you want. Uh, how many people we have now? We have 13. 13, okay, that's not bad. Yeah, give it another couple of minutes whenever you, I'll start whenever you want. Yeah. So yeah, and uh, this is particularly we've been doing World War II uh, subject matters. You know, we um, we kind of jumped around a little bit in the beginning. We, you know, we did the Battle of Moscow, we did the Kursk, uh, we did uh, Stalingrad. You uh, did I missed those? Yeah, yeah, we did those, uh, and um, so we're gonna probably do more. Um, 
you know, uh, as far as that is concerned. Mm -hmm. But we also have to incorporate the Arab Spring. You know, we still have Egypt, Syria, and Yemen to go through. Um, and then, so there's going to be a lot of interesting ones. Uh, Lisa is here. Long time no see. Lisa, how are you? All right, uh, Mark, whenever you want, um, have at it, my friend. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Uh, so uh, tonight's uh, presentation, is, it's on Rommel. It's also heav heavily influenced by the, the, the Rommel myth. Um, we'll get into the propaganda aspect. He's, uh, he's being put on a, on a pedestal by, uh, by the allies. Um, and it's in three sections. Uh, we have, I have a section before World War II, section on World War II, in a section after World War II. So it's in basically three, uh, three, three slides tonight. Uh, if you could, um, Zach, and, and also Zach is in control of the, uh, the presentation there. So if you could go to the first one on uh, with the, 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 the maps and such. And one thing, uh, so what we have here is we've got a map of Imperial Germany on the left. Uh, and the reason I put that one is, is because uh, Rommel was from a place called Schwabia in southwestern Germany, just to the west of Bavaria. Hitler was on the east from Austria, uh, just south of the, the, the Bavarian border. So they're both on the, you know, the southern Germans. When Germany was unified, it was really unified by the Prussians. And so the military, national military, was heavily dominated by the East Prussian military class. And that, that, will, that will come up later. Neither of those two men, either Bommel nor Hitler, were um, uh, were part of that class, and they were they they kind of rather disliked that that class. Uh, the the map in the middle there, with the you see the uh, kind of pinkish there, that's northeastern Italy. Italy joined World War One uh, on the side of the Allies in 1915, thinking they could knock out the Austro-Hungarian Empire rather quickly, and that turned out to be a, a grave mistake. Between 1915 and 1917, in, in northeast, the, the Italian front did not move too much. It was very, very static. Most of it was mountains. Uh, the, the, the Austrians were behind another a river called the Isonzo River. They ended up having 11 battles of the Isonzo River that the Italians kept attacking and attacking and attacking and never made it anything. In 1917, the Germans reinforced the Austrians heavily on this, on this front. And there was a and, and there was and then counterattacked. And the result the result was a battle of Caporetto. It almost took the Italians out of the, the war, came very close. The, the Austrians and the Germans came within 30 miles of Venice. And Mark, in, can I uh, 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 do one comment comment? I just want to mention that this is kind of described by Hemingway, who was there in his book Farewell to Arms. That's exactly that you know, uh, the events that was taking place, Mark was talking about. Okay, uh, thank you. So in, at the Battle of Caporetto was our Lieutenant Rommel. He'd gone to a, uh, a military academy for his education. He was um, lauded, he, he, was, he had a very successful attack on Italian trenches, captured a, a bunch of Italians, and he earned a medal called Pour le Mérite, and so it's a medal that goes back to Frederick the Great. It means four merits, basically. And it is Germany's highest award. I don't know if they have it now that nowadays, but it's also called the Blue Max. And there's also a film called the Blue Max in the, in the 70, 70s or 60s. And he was awarded this uh, the Pour le uh, Merit, or uh, Blue Max. And to give you a sense of how exclusive it was, during the entire four years of World War I, the Iron Class First Class, the Iron, Iron Cross First Class, was given seven thousand times. The Pour le Mérite was given out seventy. I'm sorry, seven hundred times. So a tenth of the number of the Iron Cross. And even then, most all of that, the seven hundred uh, Blue Maxes that were awarded, were awarded to fighter races, not to a lowly infantry commander. It would, that was really unheard of. Uh, uh, the, the, the German high command loved giving medals to uh, aces. They made great propaganda. 
uh, trench warfare, uh, not so much, it's really the, the, the Italian front. So then, and after that, uh, by 1919, June of 1919, uh, Germany signs the uh, Treaty of Versailles. Uh, step, one of the stipulations is that the uh, new German army can only have 100,000 men. So what the Germans do is take their previous army of a couple million and they take the best guys out of that. And Rommel was one of that 100,000. He spent the, uh, the 20s and part of the 30s doing um, for some various um, uh, posts. He was in charge of uh, repressing some of the rebellions in 1920. He ended up uh, doing a lot of lecturing, kind of like at a West Point sort of sort of thing. And in 1937, he wrote a book. Uh, you can see, in, you can see it, that 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 one is the um, in the upper right. It's called um, the title is Infanterie greift an, which means infantry attacks. And uh, the other thing I forgot to mention: these two photos in, down below, uh, below the map of Italy, is a map uh, or, or photo of. Uh, Rommel in the trench that he had attacked from and uh, posing with uh, the, the blue max. So this book, uh, Infanterie uh, greift an, was, I don't know if it was a bestseller, but it was, it, 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 it was, it gave him more fame already. And one of the people who read it was our famous Hitler. So already by this time, he, uh, Rommel was on Hitler's radar, so to speak. And by that time, Hitler nominated Rommel to be the military advisor to the Hitler Youth. And if some of you don't know what the Hitler Youth is, it's kind of a Nazified uh, Boy Scout, a militarized Boy Scout. Its leader was a by, guy by the name of uh, Chirac, uh, who would, should not be confused with the, uh, the, uh, the ex-president of France, um, uh, funny enough. But yeah, this, this Chirac was a diehard Nazi. Uh, he, in the, in, just as an aside, at the end of the war, uh, Chirac was sending 12, 13, 15 year old boys into combat against, against the, the meat grinder of the, the Red Army of the Western powers, and he didn't care. They were throwing away their, the, these, these poor boys into combat, he didn't care. That said, when Rommel was the military advisor to that, apparently Rommel and Chirac clashed. Uh, Rommel was only at that post for maybe about a year. Historians take that as some evidence that Rommel really, really wasn't um, a, a Nazi. What you can say though, however, is that Rommel and Hitler bonded. They were both from uh, Southern Germany or you know, Southern and, uh, and uh, Hitler was really Austrian, but he was from, you know, on that borderline. So they were out, they, they had outrageous accents, uh, bo both of them, uh, both Rommel and Hitler had um, very thick accents. Uh, actually, the Schwabian accent that Rommel had is an accent that is made fun of in Germany. It's, it's considered kind of a backwater, so to speak. Uh, and it's a favorite accent to, to make fun of. So they both, both Hitler and, and Rommel, they had that cultural background. Neither one were Prussians. They both disliked the Prussians. They both liked the idea of bold attack. And Hitler admired Rommel's book and his, you know, his having won the, the, the Blue Max. So after that, and a bit of a fiasco with the Hitler Youth, Rommel was given an assignment uh, to be in charge of Hitler's security detachment. And I'm not sure, there was also, uh, Hitler had another security detachment it's called the Leibstandarte SS, Adolf Hitler. I'm not sure exactly where the line is drawn between those, these two units, but basically, uh, uh, to put a point on it, Rommel was in charge of uh, Hitler's security when Hitler went into the, the Sudetenland, when they took that over, and then went later, that, um, um, a month later, when they took over the rest of um, the Czech Republic and Bohemia and Moravia, when, they, when Hitler drove into uh, Prague, Rommel was in charge of his, his security. When at the very beginning of the, the Polish campaign in 39 September, Hitler went into uh, to, to the closer to the front uh, in Poland. It, so again, Rommel was in charge of Hitler's uh, security. So you can say at least at the very least, Rommel was pro Hitler. He may not have been pro Nazi per se, but he was definitely pro Hitler. And it's one thing to say that a lot of these uh, German officer class disliked Hitler. Uh, they thought he was crude. Um, uh, von Rundstedt, uh, who was a, a major general, he would call Hitler the corporal, the, the bohemian corporal. 
And he was talking about Hitler, that you know, that a dictator. That's that's something that could have landed him in a concentration camp. They thought him uncouth. That he he was only he, he, that he he didn't know military affairs because he was only a corporal. Like, what could he know? And he, that he was a rabble rouser and he was useful for killing communists and he was uh, useful uh, for giving the German military more a lot more money and getting land back from Prussia, Czechoslovakia, and all that kind of stuff. They liked that. Um, but they didn't, they didn't like per se like Hitler, but they, 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 they rode the, the Nazi wave, so to speak, for their own purposes. So uh, then, um, oh, now Mark, we get to a question yeah. uh, before we move on and maybe open up a little bit for questions. So just, you know, give everybody a synopsis. The way we operate here is we basically are uh, allowing questions while we present. So all you have to do is, you know, either speak or you can send the question through the chat. Um, and, you know, questions, you know, obviously related to the topic. So the question is, interestingly enough, um, so Hitler did respect a lot of the officer corps. Um, and, you know, even though it does look at the, at the end, he was making a lot of decisions on his own and therefore was kind of disrespectful to them. So um, how did Rommel, um, you know, how did Rommel take this as being Hitler being respectful and returning the um, you know the the Czechoslovakia land, you know, so that, so that land and all that stuff is being you know him um, you know as an officer being respected and bringing back that respect when in fact Hitler in you know during the Stalingrad was making all the decisions and stuff like that. So I just wanted to get that point. Yeah, well, actually, Hitler despised the East Prussian military class, um, not as much as he despised the the Habsburgs uh, um, and that that army. Um, he 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 blamed the, the the East Prussian military class for having lost World War One, um, and he never he never never trusted uh, his German uh, his um his military staff, and he was he was quite convinced that he knew more than they did, and that's why when th things started to go bad in Russia, that he started to take over bit by bit and stopped listening to them, and so that was one thing that they they had in common. Uh, Rommel disliked, I don't think he hated these Prussian uh, military class, but he didn't like them. He was, he was a Southern German. Well, comment? Mm -hmm. So a few comments. First, I mean, the, the real big thing with Rommel was that he was not a member of the German general staff. That uh, is correct, yeah. Yeah, he was, he was just a general. And that's a huge thing. That was a huge thing in the German army because that was your pathway to promotion in high office was to be a member of the Ger German general staff and you were taught in special colleges and you get got to wear this red stripe down the side yeah, of the pants, the, down the pants, pants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, they were they were totally dominated by the by the, the Prussian the Vons as they call them right Vons is in von Papen yeah the, well uh, VON just means of and, and it, did, it denotes someone being noble. So you didn't have to be Prussian to be noble. You could, you know. Right, but the Prussians were were Vons, many of them, um, and um, so that was. So I think that that uh, Rommel's disdain for, or well, in any event, that that was the beef that Rommel had, and Rommel always had a chip on his shoulder because he made his achievements without being a member of the general staff. But a comment on his World War One. Uh, experience and on his book, a really interesting book, by the way. Um, Rommel was really Rommel got his his pour le merite not because he did trench warfare. Uh, he commanded uh, the Italian campaign was in the mountains, and he developed a a, a set of mobile tactics uh, and um, the key to everything that Rommel did. He would talk about this. Is that we'd have a guy running, in, you know, running as the as his units would advance. He had a guy with a big spool of telephone wire, who would be unspooling the telephone wire because they didn't have radio. They didn't have small radios that they could use, and so there was no real battlefield communication. And essentially, Rommel, at least he pictured himself, or he he depicted himself as being the pioneer of high-speed battlefield communications by running this wire 
wherever he went and being able to communicate with the people at the front of his column from the rear of his column. And he ended up, you know, capturing these unbelievable numbers, disproportionate numbers of Italian prisoners compared to the size of, of, of his forces. And that was, the, that was how he managed to get the Blue Max. All right. Um, and uh, so as, 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 um, I'm kind of piggybacking on that. After the, uh, the Polish campaign, Wommel went to Hitler and he had seen the, uh, the, the power of the Panzer divisions. And he asked Hitler, hey, basically, can I command one of those? And Hitler said yes, and that was one of the things he Rommel skipped over a lot of other commanders who had more right to that command, and so Rommel was perfectly fine in kind of networking to get the the post that he wanted, uh, and it, I'm sure it would have uh, um, you know uh, rubbed rubbed the, uh, some of the, uh, the the other generals who should have gotten it um, would not have would not have liked Rommel for that. So um, if you could then go to the, the next slide. Now we're going to go into, you know, into really into World War One or World War II, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, you wanna make sure we have this, this slide I'm going back and forth. Yes, okay. So what we have on this slide uh, on the left, we have um, a picture from a uh, cover from the ma magazine called uh, Signal. This is, happens to be the Dutch version of it. They, they published it in all sorts of different languages. It was the basically the kind of the life magazine of Nazi Germany, uh, known for its uh, very good photos uh, and particularly uh, color combat photos. And you see these, these these grouping of four on the left. You've got on the bottom left. You've got him pointing, you know, very authoritatively, you know, to, to the enemies over there. Let's go there. Uh, you've got an, a picture of him seated in a staff car, breaking bread, drinking with a you know a normal you know, uh, an everyday soldier. Uh, and below that, you have him uh, stepping out and uh, pushing his staff car out of the mud. These are things that your uh, Prussian military class would not have done. Um, he was, uh, he had actually been assigned a, um, a basically, a, for the lack of a better word, a propaganda guy uh, by Goebbels and, it, um, and by the guy by the name of uh, Karl Hanke. By the time, uh, and even, I, mean, I skipped over one thing, the, um, um, the, the French campaign, Rommel was in charge of the 7th uh, Panzer Division, and that 7th Panzer Division had a nickname called the Ghost Division, because neither the French nor the German High Command knew where Rommel was, because he was going so fast, and he disobeyed orders. That was another, he was, he was a bit of a rogue sort of commander. Uh, the German um, um, uh, command was more reserved, more cautious than, than Rommel. Rommel was, that's one of the things with him, he was a bit of a one trick pony in a sense. He was always attack, 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 attack. What do I'm gonna do? I'm gonna attack. He, he, didn't, have, he didn't have the flexibility that uh, would have um, been characteristic of a, a better commander. Uh, but in this instance, in May, 1940 in, in France, attack, attack, attack was the thing to do. And there was one, one particular place in, on the Meuse River where he, uh, they crossed in Eastern France in the very beginning uh, of the campaign, Goebbels saw the propaganda value of this. And so he actually brought Rommel back and brought some of the units from the 7th uh, Panzer Division to reenact the crossing of the Meuse River for a propaganda film. And I've seen it, it, it actually, actually gets up into um, um, documentaries as the real thing, but it was actually a, a reenactment. Yeah. And uh, Rommel was known for stopping the film and to make sure, hey, that, that, that the, all the details were right. He wanted to make sure everything was um, uh, accurate and it boosted his image. So he was already um, on the, 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 the radar of Goebbels, who was the propaganda minister. And uh, now he's famous for North Africa. What happened in North Africa, Libya was a colony of Italy. Egypt with the Suez Canal was under uh, British uh, domination basically because the, the Suez Canal was, it was essential or very, very, very strategic for, for the British. And Mussolini thought, oh, the, 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 the British are, they, they're on the back foot. They've just um, barely 
um, avoided getting invade, invaded by the Germans. This will be a, um, a cakewalk. We'll just walk into Egypt and I'll have I'll capture the, the Suez Canal and I'll have a, a military victory just like um, uh, Hitler into the north. It didn't turn out that way. The Italians were not prepared in any sort of way. Their commanders were not very good. They didn't have the logistics and the British kicked kicked them uh, kicked their asses basically and started invading into Libya. And as uh, Mussolini had done a couple of times during the war, he, he rang up Hitler and said, hey, I'm in trouble, can you help out? So Hitler sent him basically something on the order of two divisions. And as, as, a, as an aside, uh, in Russia, the Germans had something more on the order of 150 divisions. So this was very much of a side, uh, a side campaign, a side, um, a side front. And when, hit, when um, Rommel was in there, he immediately attacked. And it just so happened that the British were not prepared. They, weren't, they didn't think that the Germans could attack. They didn't think the Germans had all these, um, uh, the amount of troops that they did. And there was also the Italians. And he had brilliant success. He, he, he pushed way into Egypt. There was also over the course of, you know, um, 41, 42, that whole campaign went back and forth and back and forth to the East and West. But in late 41, uh, so let's say call it uh, December 5th, roughly, the Russian started, the Russians started their winter campaign, winter counterattack that really surprised the, the, the Germans. They were not ready for it and they lost a lot of ground. This was not, this didn't make very good propaganda. So the, and this was all about you know, making things look good. So while things were not doing going so well in fro in the frozen tundra of Russia, uh, with the hundred the, the the vast majority of the German military, uh, this one general has a couple of divisions and he's doing pretty good at, at, at kicking the uh, the British and he's at, and he's very photogenic. So this uh, Karl Hanka, who was uh, sent by Goebbels to be his press secretary, he followed Rommel all over the place. Rommel was to the, to his detriment. He, he loved going to the front and he spent a lot of the time at the front. And one of, it's one of his um, uh, critiques that he spent too much time at the front and not enough time coordinating battles at his headquarters where a general really should be. It's, it's you know, you want to balance and, and Rommel did too much um, uh, exciting stuff, but it made great press. And Rommel was perfectly fine with it. He loved it. I mean, it was, it was, it was you know, stro this, um, stroking his ego. Uh, but it, it, it made great propaganda, but didn't make very good uh, military sense. And Rommel was the only uh, general to actually have his own press conference in October for, uh, 1942. And I got one quote from, from this press conference uh, from, from Rommel say in, uh, saying, today we, uh, we are at the gates of Egypt um, and we intend to act. So yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, no other German general had that kind of press coverage. Uh, no other, no, no other German general had that much, that many photos taken of him and everything. There was another general in the north by the name of Dietl. Uh, was a mountain um, a commander. Uh, he was in part of uh, Operation Barbarossa in Finland. Um, they they tried to make him a bit of an equivalent to the north. Uh, but it, it didn't work out. It, didn't, it wasn't, they didn't have much success, so it wasn't worthy of um, propaganda. By, uh, towards the end of the North African campaign, the Americans land in, uh, North, in, in uh, French North Africa, Morocco and Algeria. And, there's on the, and that's to the west. To the east, the, the British crush the, uh, the, the Germans and the Italians at the Battle of El Alamein in 1942. And from there, it, the, the Germans are, and the Italians are pretty, pretty much ruled up. It was retreat after retreat. And they end up retreating all the way to Tunisia. Uh, there is one counterattack. Uh, it's called the Battle of Kazarin Pass, where the Germans uh, attack um, with, with, with panzers, with, with, with tanks. They, they attack uh, some um, American units. And the Americans are crushed. Uh, and it showed the Americans for what they were at the time, a very unprofessional, unready, untested um, uh, army led by some rather poor generals. And so the so Rommel already had a, a huge reputation uh, amongst the British. Now he has a big reputation with the Americans. Uh, and it was to the ex um, extent that sometime in uh, 1942, the British commander Auchinleck uh, distributed a, a directive to his commanders 
telling them to dispel the notion that Rommel was a superhero, that he was a military genius, because it gave it, it was it was worth military value just to be in, uh, intimidated by him. So by the time the the Tunisian campaign is is being rolled up and the it, uh, defeat is inevitable, uh, Hitler pulls Rommel out of uh, North Africa. He doesn't want his propaganda asset to be defeated. So he pulls him out, puts somebody else, and that other general is, ends up being defeated. Uh, the, the Tunisian campaign, the, the, the allies basically get something around on the order of 250,000 uh, prisoners, um, uh, German prisoners, in which qu uh, qu um, quantitatively the same as uh, the Russians did with, um, with uh, Stalingrad. So by this time, uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah, please. Sorry, uh, before we move on, we're going to open up a little for more questions, maybe additions. But uh, would you think that the reason that he, uh, I mean, obviously he was losing, you know, was you, you know, um, doing a losing campaign here? But do you think most of the reason is because a lot of the resources were dedicated more to the east? Uh, in Russia, oh, yeah, and, there, and there, yeah, there are, there are a lot of reasons. The reason uh, Rommel lost the Battle of El Alamein against the British in Egypt is because the the British were able to stop him, and um, Montgomery, who was the commander, piled up his supplies, his tanks, his airplanes, uh, the uh, artillery, until he had a massive superiority, and then he counterattacked. Uh, the other aspect, of, a critique of Rommel, uh, thanks for reminding me, is that. He was a dashing general. He liked, you know, again, he liked to attack, 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 and he was stubborn about it, but he did not pay much attention to logistics. And that's one of the reasons why the Germans lost that campaign is because they, they had trouble supplying the, his, uh, the Germans and the Italian armies in, in Libya with tanks, water, food, and precious gasoline, and replacement tanks, and replacement troops, and things like that, because the, the British had the island of Malta, and that was a huge thorn in uh, the, the German and Italians' efforts to keep their troops in North Africa supplied. And so a lot of times, Rommel would be attack, 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 and then he'd run out of gasoline. And then the, German, then the British could, you know, uh, um, uh, recover and counterattack. So he, it, that's one of the things, you know, he's, he's not, uh, he, he, he definitely has some of his faults, so to speak. So by 43, he's, he's sent back um, uh, to Germany. He's recovered. Apparently, he was rather sick uh, and exhausted from the campaign. And then he's given a command in France again in 1944. And he's under um, a, a general, uh, Rundstedt, who was a very, very famous general. I'd, I'd fought in the East. And they, they, it was, it was, they, it, there was some conflict between the two. They had different um, opinions as to something called the Panzerreserve, which means basically the reserve of tanks, tank units that were held behind the, the, the beaches. And what what um, uh, Rundstedt was convinced that the 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 Allies were going to um, land in the Pas de Calais, which is Calais in Boulogne and uh, uh, Dunkirk area, and that the the Normandy uh, beach uh, beachhead was a a ruse. Uh, Rommel kind of bought that too, but he wanted to take these these units um, on the morning of the sixth and attack the beaches, uh, the Normandy beaches. Hitler, the, when they called the the headquarters in Hitler, rather famously. He was a late sleeper, and the, the people in the uh, Hitler's headquarters, they said, oh, we, we, we're, we, we're not going to wake him up. You know, uh, and this was one of the reasons why the Allies won, because the German um, panzers were kind of uh, paralyzed. By the time, um, so late June, early July, Rommel is telling Hitler, we're defeated. It, it's no use. We might as well surrender. We've got to do this for the sake of the troops. And that's not something Hitler wanted to hear. And Hitler started to turn on, on Rommel and uh, really started to really, by that, by that time in the war, Hitler did not want to hear reality, basically. Sometime in July, Rommel is in his uh, staff car in Eastern France and he's strafed by either an American or um, a British uh, fighter. And he's seriously wounded, he's, go he's, in, he's in hospital. And then the next thing to happen is the July plot. Um, uh, led by uh, von Stauffenberg, a, a Prussian. 
basically uh, the, the long and the short of it, they left a bomb in Hitler's, uh, next to Hitler in his uh, military headquarters in Rastenburg in East Prussia. It goes off uh, by, uh, by a, a miracle, Hitler is only wounded. And then Hitler goes, uh, go, goes for revenge. He, anyone who is connected with that, that plot, they find it, they torture hundreds of people, their families are sent to concentration camps. And one of these people, the one of the, the conspirators for the July plot who tried to kill Hitler, mentions Rommel. We don't, I, I, I don't know if that's, they, they know exactly what he said, but just mentioning him flies Hitler into a, a rage. There's no evidence that Rommel was part of that July plot. Uh, there's no evidence that he even knew of it, but it didn't matter at, by that point. So Hitler, uh, orders Rommel to go to um, uh, headquarters to report. Rommel says, nah, I'm still recovering. I really can't. Thank you very much. Hitler sends a couple of officers to his, and this is when um, uh, Rommel is at his home with his wife and his son, Manfred. These two officers show up, ask to speak to Rommel outside, and they basically tell him, you either come with us and um, report to, um, to headquarters, and it, with the undertone, you'll be interrogated and tortured, or and also that your family will go to a concentration tap, a camp or be shot, or you take this pill uh, and commit suicide. And famously, Rommel commits suicide in order to protect his family. And that's another thing that makes him look good. Uh, he, it makes him look to the allies, anti-Nazi, anti-Hitler, and he died just to save his family. But this, so despite the fact that uh, of, of, the, of this killing of Rommel basically, uh, it was never released that it was because of the July plot. He was a hero. They still wanted to use him for propaganda purposes. So they, Hitler gave him a very lavish state funeral uh, and, and lauded him. So, yeah, great general, everything like that. Great hero. We love him and everything like that. And in the reality, it was because of Hitler that he, 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 was, he, he died. So, then, uh, so that's, the, that's the end of the war. Now we're going to the, the post-World War II area, era and uh, getting to the, uh, the next. Can we maybe talk a little bit about the, you know, the, all of the World War II stuff before we- Yeah, keep please, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I have a real different interpretation of what was happening between von Ronstadt and, uh, and Rommel, uh, which is essentially that von Ronstadt wanted to keep the reserve inland at, um, at transportation junctions, exactly, so they could react very rapidly to wherever the invasion came. Rommel, who had had the experience of Allied air power in North Africa, which was really the, the most effective thing that, uh, that he couldn't deal with at all, um, wanted the defenses to be moved up front to the beaches and he would gamble, He'd put some in the Pas de Calais, put some in uh, Normandy, but he knew that when the attack started, no other reserve was gonna be able to get to the beach because the, they would be interdicted. They would be interdicted. Yeah, we're on the same page there. So, it, but it, you know, it, it was, it, uh, okay, okay. Also, um, Rommel was a tremendously uh, powerful leader. And he was an improviser. In the event in the uh, invade in the invasion of France, where he was commanding the Ghost Division, he, as you say, ran ahead and was in danger of being cut off in a counterattack. And that's when what he basically did is he started using his 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 88 anti-aircraft guns to go after. Uh, the the uh, Allied tanks, and he was the first to do that, and that became uh, the Germans realized that they had this weapon that was really terrific, but they had never thought of it as a tank killer. In North Africa, what Rommel would do is he would kind of like Philip of Macedon, he would draw his enemy in to his emplaced. 88 anti-tank guns. Yeah, and the British would just attack, attack like like uh, like the uh, charge of the, the the last brigade, and they would die. And you know, so this is you know, yes, Rommel was tremendously aggressive, but a Rommel 
attack, you know, w- was designed in some ways to put him on the tactical defensive, you know, which is an advantage. Mm-hmm. So he's, I'm saying he was a brilliant tactician. He was right about where to put the forces uh, in fortress Europe. And uh, I don't know what else really to speak to about the shenanigans. Mm-hmm. Okay, let me just add, we don't know that he was right because if he had put all his forces on the beaches, they would have been pounded by naval air, naval and air power because the Germans okay, only, well, I'll, two, two, no, only two planes actually flew over those beaches uh, on June 6th. They, German they, planes, German they planes. They were a lot more yeah. allied. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying, all I'm saying is that the central uh, strategy which was followed didn't work and it didn't work in exactly the way that Rommel said it wouldn't work. Maybe the forward strategy would also have fallen on his face. That's absolutely possible. Mm-hmm. But the one that they did was not successful. I agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm a little bit more critical than you I guess if, if, with, in, in the North African campaign because there, there was one, um, there was one uh, um, incident in, when they were attacking uh, Tobruk, which was um, besieged by the, the Germans after they'd gone, continued east. And Rommel really wanted Tobruk because logistically it it would help him because it blocked the the, the coastal road. And he ordered the commander there attack. And the the, the Germans dutifully attacked, like wave after wave. And they were beaten back, beaten back, beaten back. And that that commander reports back to Rommel that, yeah, yeah, they're too strong here, that we can't, we're just losing men. And, And what did Rommel say? Attack! 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 That's all he. That's all he knew. He, he never. Uh, he, I'm sure he never run read uh, Sun Tzu. He didn't understand the the necessity of. Well, sometimes you, you you don't attacking isn't always the right thing to do. And like I said, when he, he ran out of, of of gasoline because he was just like a, like a, um, I'm not gonna say like a, a, a dog ch- like char- He was just so focused on charging, charging. Oh yeah, I'm, now I'm out of gasoline. Now I can't do anything. That's, and that's, to me, that's not someone who thinks about some of the more complex parts. He, he was just like, I, he was just like a bit of a one trick pony, attack, attack, attack. That's, he didn't know anything else. Okay, Mark, but I would suggest the counter argument is he's not being supplied. He knows he has to do things quickly because he's not going to have the time. He can't win a long campaign there. He's not getting anything from Germany or Italy. So he, this is, you know, I, he doesn't really have a lot of options. If he can't take Tobruk, he's going to have to retreat. Which he does, and then he attacks again, and the next time he takes Tobruk on the fly. I mean, he just goes yeah, right well, through it. Because yeah. Tobruk was an important port, and it tremendously shortened the supply line mm-hmm. for him as he's trying to get to Egypt. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, the, the interesting point, also, I mean, he was he was um, obviously um, very skilled, but also involved in a little bit of cunning. I guess he had a portion when he was in uh, Africa. He would attach a propeller to the Volkswagen <laughs> to make it look like there's a dust would create from the desert, and they would make it look like there would be more troops, like there was a divisions of troops with him. Instead, mm-hmm. of, and it's a brilliant. <laughs> thing. I never heard that, but it's a brilliant idea. It's a brilliant. Idea. Yeah, there's no, when he best. first when he first lands in uh, Africa, he has his tanks just go round and round, so it looks like he has more tanks. They go into the village, right. go out, do a complete circle, go into the village again. Yeah, there's he um, actually rehearse it at, at the um, at a parade to uh, to do that, and then I think that's a very Sun Tzu thing to do. <laughs> yeah. There was another Just aspect that of, type of deception I, to make yourself look more powerful than you are. There's another aspect that I did talk about was uh, the um, military intelligence, and it, and it, go, it cuts two ways for Rommel. In Cairo, the American military attaché was briefed on a regular basis by, um, by, the, by the British. And this is before uh, the, the Americans get involved. And he would report back to, by radio back to, to Washington. That said, the Germans had broken the American code. So they were reading the American military attaché's summary of what the British had told them in, in, in real time. So he had an advantage there. He had a disadvantage that he never learned about is that the British had the, uh, had the Enigma co- code. So, you know, which one is more important? I'm not sure, but uh, the military intelligence also um, plays a part into this. Yeah, I, w- I would suggest Enigma because when Montgomery 
does his El Alamein campaign, he knows how many runners uh, Rommel actually has, and he knows he's not getting any oil from Italy. So yeah, 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 I think yeah. Enigma is really huge. So how close did Rommel actually get, right? To what? To, to, what? to, to let's say, reaching Egypt. Oh, he was in Egypt many times. Well, what I'm saying is, re let's say, reaching reaching Alexandria. Uh, yeah, or maybe perhaps the Suez Canal, perhaps. Right. That's, well, that's right. right. I'm assuming you get to Alexandria, you get to the Suez Canal. Yeah, the Suez so Canal was that's, his, his... that's his strategic objective. And uh, I think the and the, the El Alamein chokehold was a lot weaker when he ran out of gas than when he ultimately attacked. So we've had 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 higher command in Germany understood the strategic importance of it uh, and allowed him to keep going when, when he could have, they could have sabotaged the uh, Suez Canal. Yeah, I, I don't think he was really in the cards. Uh, the Germans weren't that powerful. Um, I think Rommel probably did his best as, as much as he, any, any general could have for the Germans. Um, and well, I think he did. I'm just saying he was at the point where he ran out of gasoline, as you, as you so famously point out, you know, had he been supplied as he should have been by higher headquarters, mm -hmm. there would have, there, there was a potential for success. Yeah, there was. Yeah, there was. Yeah, I would also that's, suggest that's war. And, you know, that's war. Sometimes you run out of stuff and you can't. That's, that's true. That's true. <laughs> it's also sometimes what you have, you know, you do when you're besieging a, a place like Tobruk. You yeah. have to one person who doesn't get enough credit is Auchinleck because he's the one who stopped him at Alam Hoffa. That's when Rommel was still on the fly. He was running for the uh, for the Nile, and that's where he get his first his first stop leading up to El Alamein is a place called Alam Hoffa, which you know very little is known about. But that's where Rommel is stopped, and that's where he can't go any further because yes, he is out of fuel. Yeah, and also one one thing to to realize is that the the British got better and better. Uh, they were a little sloppy. They could they defeated the Italians easily, uh, but once it came to the Germans, like like uh, like um, um, I, I forget it was a John who um, had mentioned that they 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 took their Matildas and charged these eighty eight millimeter uh, cannons. And then they got, they were slaughtered. The the British learned bit by bit how to fight maneuver warfare in the desert. Uh, so by the time they learned, and then they got all these supplies, then it was over for the for the Germans and the Italians. Well, well it was just I mean, Montgomery was very conservative. Very he didn't move very. forward until he had just such an overwhelming advantage. Exactly. Yeah, that that's. So, um, he, and that's and two different, very different commanders, both in the same war. Um, uh, Montgomery was in the trenches in France, in, in Flanders, and he saw the, the slaughter. And he, also the other thing is the British had to be more cautious with their, their men. They didn't have that many. They couldn't take the losses again, like they, they'd done in World War I. Sure. sure. And that's what then that later on was a bit of a conflict with the Americans who wanted to, you know, go, 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 go. So anybody else have any questions or want to ask questions before we move on? Um, thank you, Mark. This was amazing. Uh, well, there's one more slide. There's one more slide, sorry. Uh, th this is the slide. There's another slide? Uh, let's see here, where are you at? Uh, this, yeah, this is the slide. Yeah, this is, yeah, but uh, uh, there's a bit to talk about this. Um, the, the yeah. after World, we, we were just talking about World War, the, the World War II. Um, we were still on the, the, the previous one. Um, what happens after World War II? Rommel is, has this already a, a, a big reputation. He's been puffed up by Goebbels. He's been puffed up by the Americans, been puffed up by, by the British. They put him on a pedestal. He, um, he is seen a bit as, um, an, for right or for wrong, a bit of an anti-Nazi towards the end. He had a reputation in the um, in the North African campaign of being a fair, fair to and, and, and a fair or chivalrous to uh, prisoners. The North African campaign was the only campaign that some people say was a, a campaign fought without hate. So he he comes out clean, and afterwards, nineteen you have nineteen fifty, you have the Korean War. 
the you have the Soviet huge Soviet advantage um, in tanks, infantry, or everything in in Europe. NATO was um, uh, is rather threatened by this. The, the NATO re realizes they're going to have to rearm the Germans. They're going to have to. The Germans are going to have to have their own army. And no one, certainly not the French, the Dutch, the German, or the, the Belgians, the Dutch, the, the Norway, no one wanted that. Um, but the Soviets had such an overwhelming superiority, it was a necessary sort of thing. But they, 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 they were, and people in NATO and the Germans were convinced that it's, they had to do something else. They had to, basically what they came up with was a, uh, the clean Wehrmacht or clean army myth. And this myth was, um, it, totally a myth. It's, it's, it, the base of it is, is, was written when the Germans um, uh, were asked by the Americans to write the history of World War I. Uh, they were uh, led by a, a German Halder and they, they whitewashed their participation in the war. That basically it, it goes down to, oh yeah, that crazy, that crazy Austrian, we never liked him. Boy, he was, you know, it's all his fault. You know, we didn't, we, we didn't like him. Not true. Um, uh, they, they, the, the German army was perfectly willing to go um, in uh, uh, wars of um, uh, aggression and, and, and conquest. They, um, they killed uh, numerous um, uh, soldiers, they killed numerous civilians, uh, uh, I think more than a million Russian POWs starved to death. Uh, the, the occupation that was ba of, these, of, these, of these countries was based by, on, on the Wehrmacht. So clean Wehrmacht, absolutely, it was an absolute myth. It was, it was um, no truth to it whatsoever. Uh, but they needed that kind of thing to say, oh, you know, the, 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 yeah, sure, Hitler was bad, the Nazis were bad, but the German army that we're going to recreate, they weren't bad. And that was kind of a, something that was the myth that was needed. So everybody was okay with it, you know, the Americans, the, the British, everyone. And another thing that allowed when, when Rommel comes into it is that you got to think about the, the Eastern Front, where R Rommel was never there. The Eastern Front, um, uh, Hitler had called it uh, a Vernichtungskrieg, a war of extermination, and just not conquest. They, they, Hitler wanted to exterminate the Ukrainians and the Russians. And there was also something called the Commissar Befehl, uh, which is um, after the war was rather controversial. It's basically or in order to the Wehrmacht, the army, that whenever you capture uh, political commissars in the Red Army, you shoot them immediately. The army was perfectly fine. They did not um, object to that whatsoever. So you have people like Rundstedt, Guderian, Manstein, Kesselring, all these guys had fought on the, um, on the Eastern Front, but Rommel, he hadn't fought there. So he, he, he never sullied his hands with that, that dirty war in the East. So he was, Kind of clean and wasn't too tarnished by um, by the Nazi regime, um, and also the fact that he was forced to commit suicide by Hitler kind of makes him look a bit like a victim. Uh, the 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 notion that he may have been involved in the July plot makes him kind of like an anti-Nazi or anti-Hitler, even though there wasn't much. There was really no hard proof. And then after World War II, there's two or three British his, um, uh, military historians who wrote very good things about Rommel. And that, all this combined, really made, created um, um, uh, a, a real myth out of Rommel. And if you look at the, um, um, at the, the PowerPoint, you've got, NATO, you know, you've got NATO, you've got Warsaw Pact. On the top there, you've got a, 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 a shiny new West German um, army, uh, private. And these three um, images, you know, George, um, uh, George, uh, John, George Mason, I think his name is. Uh, very famous actor, very good actor. In the in the 60s and 70s, there were three or four major films with Rommel, and this was done by the Americans. You know, it, you, there's no imagining that the, the 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 Russians would have made a a a, um, a lauding a, like a, a positive film about any of the German generals that had invaded their country. Um, this is really quite different. Uh, and it, it, it was based on the myth, and then these films inflated the myth that much more. And you look at the, uh, the, the two pictures on the, on the, in the bottom, he's, you know, he's, point, he's, 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 in, he's almost in combat, and he's pointing the men, go this way. Uh, here on the bottom, he's on top of a tank, you know, and right in combat with two, two British Matildas um, uh, behind him. <clears throat> that never happened. But, you know, th this, that inflated him just that much more.
So that, that's about that's about the end of it. Um, and uh, Rommel and the and the myth. I mean, I think he was one of the great tactical commanders of all time. Uh, with all of the faults that that you describe, mm -hmm. he was yeah, no, uh, he was he was he inspired his his men, and he was knew how to um, find a, a weakness and maximize his strength, and he was bold. Uh, and uh, he certainly did much better than the British commanders, Wavell and Auchin like. Yeah, yeah, and I mean. If he had been on the Eastern Front, there's no doubt in my mind that he would have been successful on the Eastern Front as long as yeah, no doubt, he would have been no able doubt. to deal with, you know, whatever administrative issue they would impose on him. Mm -hmm. But um, so th that's what his talent was, and the idea of being uh, an upfront commander that was the the uh, doctrine that Guderian had installed. That they, the Germans had actually built tanks that were, you know, specially designed as mobile headquarters uh, with whatever radio hubs they had. Yeah, they had that. People the, the could go ahead. So it's just a question of what level do you get to? You know, you get to exactly. a core command, you can't do that. In the divisional command, maybe you can get away with it. Yeah, that's that. That's one. Uh, that's one critique, and I forget who who said it. That. Um, uh, Rommel was an excellent division commander. He wasn't ready for being anything higher than that. I, whether I that mean, was a German, the, the, a German the, critique. The African camp campaign was kind of made for him because it was narrow. You know, he didn't have to uh, take a huge amount of stuff into account. Well, he, yeah, he, didn't have the a, space. he didn't have a whole army group to uh, take care of. Right, right but a very narrow area in which he can operate. Uh -huh. I will agree with what Mark said earlier, though. It, he did not leave clear instructions for his subordinates when he went you know, rolling into the desert. And they had to make a lot of decisions without knowing exactly what Rama was doing. So a lot of times he was just, you know, you, you mentioned his uh, telephone wire in World War One. Well, he wasn't doing anything like that in World War II. He would just disappear. I mean, he would disappear for a couple of days, and everybody uh -huh. there doesn't know what what should we do now. You know, so yeah, yeah. I, I can see what you mean. And there was there was actually one incident that I I, I saw uh, I read when I was doing the research is Rommel is at, at one point Rommel is at at the front. His second in command uh, ends up taking an airplane, uh, you know, for for whatever reason, and the the uh, the pilot gets lost, ends up across British lines and is shot down and that his Rommel's second in command is captured. And so they, there was no one there at, at headquarters to do anything, except there happened to be another general um, there uh, of sufficient rank. And he said, okay, I'm taking charge. He wasn't meant to be there. He was, he was just having to be there and he took charge. But yeah, that, that, that sort of thing can lose battles. So now I just want, thank you, Mark, by the way, this was incredible. And, uh, you know, now I just want to spend about 15 minutes, just go over his earlier life and maybe just kind of summarize it all, um, if you guys don't mind. So um, early life, right? Um, Rommel was, interestingly enough, a third of uh, five children. And, uh, you know, uh, he also had, um, as we know, two brothers, you know, Carl and Garhard and a um, sister named Helene. And I think there was a third brother who probably had passed away earlier. Um, his father was actually a Protestant headmaster um, and uh, of a secondary school uh, in Alain. And his mother was a daughter of a prominent um, uh, dignitary. So, uh, I mean, as we know, we were, he was born in 1881, uh, a few kilometers from city Ulm. And um, so let me just uh, move on. Oh, what's interesting about him is um, his father actually uh, sent him to the army. He had, you know, none of his family have any kind of military background. And uh, so he was sent there. So now as a young officer, um, he had a girlfriend, what's interesting. Her name is uh, Van Burgersteme. And in 1913, she got pregnant. 
uh, with a daughter. Um, and what's interesting is while he was in the front of World War I, he sends a letter saying that, sorry, I'm not gonna marry you. And, um, you know, basically uh, lets that, you know, daughter go. Um, meaning like, uh, and then, but it was interesting enough though, um, when, um, when basically uh, he doesn't want to take care of the family, but he writes a letter to his mom saying that, uh, please make sure that you, you give enough to my, um, well, whatever, out of wedlock child and, and my girlfriend. And so let's go to the next slide. It, it will be very quick. Um, so uh, interestingly enough, um, his father actually, uh, I mean, when he started his army, he joined the 124th Woodenberg Infantry Regiment as an officer cadet in 1910. Um, you know, and he went basically to cadet school in Danzig. Danzig, as we remember, used to be part of Germany, but was given to Poland as a, you know, Treaty of Versailles. And, you know, uh, um, and therefore, you know, was, you know, obviously there was a lot of big German population there as well. He graduated in 1911 and, uh, and basically commissioned as a lieutenant in 1912. Um, in cadet school, that's where he met his future wife, um, you know, uh, and, you know, married her. Um, Lucia Maria, uh, her name is, and uh, basically World War I, uh, he mostly fought in France, Romania, Italy, um, and he was part of the Wunderberg Mountain Battalion of Alpencorp. I mean, we already had mentioned that he got the medal and everything. I just wanted to say that all his life, he was an in infantry. I mean, his book is all about attack uh, as, as, um, uh, as uh, Paul had mentioned, uh, it, it was, you know, how to fight in the mountainous area, mountainous divisions. And all of a sudden, uh, before the, you know, French invasion, um, he's asking to get a tank division and he gets a tank division. But what's interesting, uh, they used to be called a ghost division because he was so far up front that people, I mean, a lot of the, um, you know, um, what, I don't know what in German is, but in Russia it would be Stavka or the head, head army couldn't, couldn't catch up to him. And they didn't know where he was at any point. That's why he called him a ghost, ghost division. So let's just move on quickly. Um, so actually he was a participant of Blitzkrieg, um, you know, um, let's just uh, go next. It's gonna be very quickly. Uh, it's interesting enough, Irvin actually met Hitler um, in uh, 1934 uh, while attending a festival at Godstock. Uh, basically, what's happening is uh, Rommel liked Hitler immediately, but what's also interesting, Rommel was never part of the Nazi party. He never got enlisted in, into the ideology. Or maybe he did, but, you know, obviously it wasn't official. Uh, and he was very mesmerized He's saying, you know, he was deeply impressed by Hitler's work. Uh, you know, he was saying that this guy is, you know, he does miracles basically, but he didn't know that um, all that uh, economic advancement was a farce. Um, what's interesting is uh, now after the Versailles Treaty, Germany was only allowed to keep 100,000 um, infantry troops and therefore, um, you know, uh, Rommel as a professional military person was not really needed that much. So he became a lecturer at Potsdam. Um, and then he wrote a book, Attack on uh, Matitude, I think it's called. And, um, you know, and what's interesting, he never actually, he always considered uh, the, uh, the Jewish question a negative thing for Nazis. Um, anybody has any questions or want to add anything or? Hello? <laughs> Anybody still on? Yeah, of course. Yeah, we can hear. I, Don't worry. I, have, a, I have a question. Uh, if uh, Hitler trusted him so much and there were pals, and why he didn't, um, why he never thought about sending him to the Eastern Front? Because Hitler thought that the Eastern Front was something that will be done very easily or, or he, he was just happy with what Rommel was doing in 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 Africa 
that he wasn't accomplishing anything at the end. I mean, was at the end, yeah, but we're talking about 1941, 1942, when um, Rommel was having success and was a, a, prop, a propaganda uh, idol. So and why pull him out of a command where he's, he's, he, he looks really good and he's having some success? I, I would imagine that the army brass didn't really appreciate Rommel very much. That, 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 that they would too. be very happy to send him off, you know, in this isolated theater where they don't have to bother with him for the important stuff, which is the Eastern Front. Yeah, I'm sure that played as well. Correct, correct. Um, so, uh, you know, um, basically, you know, we come to the World War II and uh, Hitler was part of the uh, Polish campaign. He was part of Blitz Blitzkrieg. Um, and, you know, basically, you know, he was commanding, uh, I can't, I know how to pronounce it, Fuhrberlad Battalion during the Polish campaign. Uh, all, often moving close to the front lines and seeing much of a hit, and seeing much of a Hitler, he actually returned to Berlin to conduct Hitler, Hitler's victory parade. It was part of the Hitler's entourage, so he was very close to Hitler. It's it's basically their neck and neck. So Rommel had asked before the French campaign uh, Hitler for a command of Panzer Division, um, which is the you know sixth uh, what was on 1940 or uh, February sixth just three months before the invasion of France and the Low Countries. He was given a command of the 7th Panzer Division. Uh, so basically, Rommel took part in the in invasion of France and other Low Countries. His division was given the name uh, Suspender, <laughs> Suspenster Division or Ghost Division uh, because he was uh, he always had an element of surprise and higher ups could not keep track of his division movements. Sorry. Uh, also, you should note that he, he did take major objectives in, in record time. So he did come he did come through with the goods, even though he was a cowboy. Correct. Correct. That's correct. So we already went through this. This is just a summary, guys, and just some you know interesting facts. Um, reason for North Africa Corps uh, take control of Libya, parts of Egypt, control of oil rigs. That was one of the you know some of the reasons that you know they invaded. So it's interesting that um, uh, before obviously you know going to Africa, he was promoted uh, and given the fifth light division. It was you know an uh, Africa where he was given. Uh, the name Desert Fox. So he led the offensive strike against British Commonwealth forces, forces that had been fighting against Italian forces in previous um, and previous to uh, Rommel arrival. So it's interesting is, it, you know, Mussolini totally, you know, I don't know if betrayed a former ally in British, British and just basically was like a scavenger trying to take as much territory as, you know, and, and as he wanted to. And um, so Rommel had captured 130, you know, um, basically British, prior to that, had captured 130,000 Italian soldiers in nearly 400 tanks uh, with about 7,000 Italian soldiers, you know, rough rubble lead uh, that, that against the British, actually pushed the British back at the port of Tabruk. What's interesting with port of Tabruk, Italians actually fortified it prior to British taking it over. So, when he, when, when uh, Ronald was attacking him, he was attacking in a very fortified position. That's why he lost about 1,200 troops. Uh, it was like a Pyrrhus with victory, so to speak. Um, you, know, you know, we talked about Rommel versus Montgomery. Uh, you know, uh, basically, initially, Montgomery had, you know, had, had lost battles against him. And then, you know, they called Montgomery army as Desert Rats. Uh, you know, and then in the, essentially he prevailed. Anybody has any questions or uh, before I come to the end of this or want to add anything? I guess not. Yeah, everything was very good. Yeah, okay. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Rommel he came in contact with Americans for the first time. During the battle, Rommel caused, you know, loss of 6,000 men, 183 tanks and 200 artillery pieces. Clearly, he knew how to plan a fight, basically. So, um, 
1944, as we've said already, and I, you know, just wanted to mention that, you know, basically he was given a choice to poison himself, he did. But prior to that, actually he was put in the periphery because probably Hitler was suspecting it. And he was actually Rommel's last military appointment, uh, you know, after he's done with Africa and all that stuff, was a command of Army B, Army Group B, responsible for 1944 March of the Northwest, nor, nor, Northwestern Europe. Uh, so basically that's, that's it. That's the end of my presentation. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay. So that's it. Uh, all the people dropped out, so it wasn't that interesting, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, it was very good. Yeah, thank you. It was interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, any, uh, uh, unfortunately, tomorrow uh, presentation got canceled uh, due to the misunderstanding with me and Sergio. Sorry. We're going to do Hanseatic League on Sunday. So, uh, tomorrow, no presentation. We're moving it to March 11th. And, um, you know, we will. Uh, you know, we will definitely do the ancient web weaponry on March 11th, but not tomorrow. And, um, oh, we have a new person, right? Uh, uh, Meru, you came to the, you know, Navalny, right? Can you introduce yourself? So, you know, while we're, we're on. Uh, yeah, I was in Navalny. I'm, uh, my name is Meru Erd. Uh -huh. I'm, Meru. I'm from Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. Uh, yeah, I'm from Uzbekistan, actually. <laughs> ah, nice to meet you. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm currently I'm in Virginia, but uh, yeah, I'll soon, I'll soon be back home. Where Astana or Almaty? Oh, Astana. Well, I'm originally from Almaty, but um, I'll, I'll live now in Astana. I see. Very interesting. That, so that's why you were listening to Navalny. Yeah. <laughs> they think they're gonna let you let you back. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows, yeah. Who knows, right? Did you like Navalny? Was uh, was it informative too as well? Or? Well, I, apparently, uh, I watched the movie. Um, so most the documentary, of the things, right. Yes, the documentary. Sorry, uh, so most of the things I was aware already aware, but of course, a little bit of background is uh, interesting to know. All right. Anybody else? Anything to to uh, add or say anything or? Uh... Uh, thanks, Zach. Was was very good, very interesting. I I had very little knowledge about Rommel. I knew that he was fighting in North Africa, but and he was uh, defeated by Montgomery eventually. But uh, that's all I knew. Yeah, and uh, thanks for everybody. You know, adding you know your piece. Thanks, Paul. Always insightful uh, additions. Um, you know, Mark did an amazing job. He's you know he's not on. Lisa is back. Lisa, how you been? You know when you know when are you when are we expecting you back on the Greek stuff? <laughs> Meaning just listening. Oh, unmute yourself. I am here. I will try and participate as much as I can. Always a pleasure. You guys rock. You have so much um, such breadth and depth of knowledge. Yeah. We have a group. group. Nice to see everybody. Nice to see you as well. Yeah. Hi, Hi Lisa. Yeah. So again, um, and so do go to the um, our website omnicarta.org, and uh, even Meru, when you're in Kazakhstan, you know, still join our you know Zoom. I Probably will try at to. night. Probably gonna be at night, but uh, uh, in any case, and um, Marika is still on, or if no picture today. <laughs> I com my computer is very very crazy. I cannot make the picture now, and sometimes I cannot mute to unmute. I need a new computer, that's for sure. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I appreciate that. Maggie, and thanks always uh, for joining as well. And I uh, hope you guys enjoyed today. And uh, I want to wish everybody a nice evening. This was a short one today. Usually we go and spill over over three hours. <laughs> <laughs> today we're, you know, we're letting everybody go. And uh, fortunately, tomorrow, no presentation, but on Sunday. And then next week is going to be busy, too. We have three on next week, so. We have, um, uh, you know, we have, um, you know, the uh, EV, and I think, hold on, let me just look at the schedule, what we have. Will we eventually have the EV presentation? We will. Uh, yes, we would definitely, we definitely will. So next week, we'll have the um, electronic vehicle on Wednesday. The problem is that Joshua that's supposed to present Vikings versus 
um, you know, uh, Al Andalus actually decided that he wants to finish his book on the same <laughs> subject matter, and uh, we'll do one in March, and uh, then. So I'm sorry. What is Wednesday then? Wednesday we have the um, future of electronic vehicle, um, Tesla Neo X Peng Li, and on Saturday we have Alexander the Great, second part two. All right, um, and and then we have uh, yeah, and then that's it I think for next week, just two presentations. Oh no, there's gonna be a third one. Or I can remember. Oh, history of well. Um, Rome, Greece, and Egypt, and uh, uh, how busy they've gotten in their bedrooms. So let's just that's it. history of sex in Egypt, Greece, and Rome, basically. And when is that? <laughs> when is that? That's going to be on the 18th. 18th. Okay. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Okay, thank you, Zach. Okay, well, yeah, very interesting. Take care.